Man, I don't know about you, but I needed that worship. I was uh, standing there and I'm like, hey, we could go, we could do this again if you want, you know? Um, we're gonna be in John 14 today, John 14 and 15. So if you have a Bible or you wanna look that up on your phone, John chapter 14 and 15, skin in the game. Uh, we, we introduced this teaching series last week based off uh, really John 1 verse 14. And it says this, the word Jesus became flesh and dwelled among us. And what we were talking about last week and what we're gonna continue to talk about today is this idea that Jesus, God with skin, came down and he modeled for us what it looks like to live the life that God created us to live. And in that, Jesus did some pretty remarkable things, but he did some things in which we can look at and we can look at his life and model our lives around that give us hope and give us the ability to do the same. So we get this glimpse into to what Jesus' life looked like and because of that, we can emulate that. We can press towards living that same life. So last week, we talked about the fact that uh, Jesus prayed and how he prayed. And the reality in that is we asked the question, why did Jesus pray if he was God, right? Uh, wh why would Jesus pray? And what we realized as we dug in last week is there was this, uh, through prayer, there was this connection that Jesus had in which he was able to receive the power from heaven to do the work that he needed to do here on the earth. And we asked this question, is prayer in your life a, a spare tire or is it the steering wheel? Is it the thing that drives your life or is it what you go to in moments of crisis? So this morning we're gonna build off that and we're gonna follow that by talking about what I think is one of the most life-giving things you'll ever experience in your Christian walk. And unfortunately, many people will follow Jesus and as they follow Jesus, they get the life sucked out of them and they kind of live this defeated, demoralized life. And, and when you live in spiritual defeat, following Jesus kind of becomes this spiritual list of do's and don'ts and it actually doesn't become a life full of hope and joy, but it becomes a life that's somewhat deflating. So this morning, I want you to know that what we're talking about can be one of the most freeing and, and life-giving things for someone who follows Christ. It's something I wish I'd understood much earlier in my faith. And I'm telling you, when it comes to following Christ, this is one of the most impactful things that we could possibly understand. So as we jump into this, I just want to pray and ask God to speak to us through John chapter 14 and 15 today. God, you are good. And uh, we come to you and we just ask uh, Lord, that you receive us just as we are. We, we all come to you with uh, busy weeks, with busy agendas, uh, chaotic lives. We, we come to you with a lot and you don't expect us to have it all figured out when we come to you. We're able to come to you and just rest in your presence. And I pray today that as we sit and we dig into your word and we worship you, Father, that you would do in us what we can't do on our own. Uh, Father, that you would transform our hearts and our minds and that we would leave changed because of you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, what we're talking about today when we talk about skin in the game is so key that it's it's taught to our children. It's, it's taught at the earliest age. Uh, if, if you don't teach this at someone, to someone at the, at the the smallest of moments in their life, the earliest moments, then their lives become a disaster. It's, it's big enough and powerful enough to control armies, and yet it's necessary uh, enough to, to teach it to a small puppy, and it's this word obedience. Yeah, super exciting. I could tell as I said that, you guys were like, man, that sounds awesome. It's a powerful word, but it's a word that many of us don't necessarily embrace. It's not a word that carries an immediate excitement for many of us. Maybe you grew up in a, a setting that was uh, harsh or even religiously legalistic and you hear the word obedience and you think, oh great, here we go. This is where the, the guilt stuff starts coming in about how I'm not gonna be able to measure up. And I wanna assure you today that if that's your background, I, I think today's gonna be a, a breath of fresh air for you. If you just hang tight, if you hang with me, I think today we'll put together some pieces that maybe you didn't have before. When we first begin our spiritual journey, Oss Hillman says, we often make decisions from convenience. Often we decide what the outcome is that we want and then make decisions based on the perceived outcome. If it's a positive outcome, then we'll make an obedient decision. And this is called outcome-based obedience. 
But one of the greatest challenges of following Jesus, and we see this when he came to earth, we see this when he put skin into the game, is that much of what he calls us to do, we may not know the outcome of. So when you follow Christ, you don't always know where it's gonna take you. In fact, many people have chosen not to follow Jesus for that very reason. It's a radical obedience. It's this idea of trusting Jesus with the outcome. And obedience can be based on several different things. I would tell you, here's the three that I think are the most common. You have outcome-based obedience, fear-based obedience, which often is used for manipulation, not always, but often. And you have love-based obedience. And I've tried all three with our dog, Tucker. We have a, a lab and we've used the, the treat method, right? This is the outcome-based obedience with our Labrador retriever. And, and when he goes outside, he doesn't think he belongs outside. He is one of those dogs that when you let him out, he thinks he's being punished. I'm like, this is our house. You have taken over our house. And so he'll go outside and he'll kind of look back like, I can't believe you're doing this to me. You know, I could use the toilet. You know, like that's, that's the look he has on his face. And he goes out, so when he comes back in, in order to say, hey, good boy, we give, give him a treat, right? But it only, you know this because it's outcome-based. If we give him three or four treats in a row, he, he all of a sudden gets really bored. You know, he's like, I don't know if I'm into the treat anymore. I've, I got the outcome I wanted, you know? You don't have to keep trying to, 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 to give me the treats. Oh, I've used fear. Uh, because he thinks he's a human, he'll walk into the kitchen while we're all in there cooking and getting ready for dinner, and he'll stand right underneath your feet. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't even know what's going on above, you know, the cabinets. And he'll stand right beneath your feet. And I'm like, I'll look at him like, Tucker, out of the kitchen. You know, I give him the stern look. I point. Like, I'll, I'll beat you. You know, that's what I want to say, but I don't because our kids don't let me say that. But, but, but that's how I feel, you know. The fear base, I'm like, get in the living room. You know, the stern, you know. Mm, mm, you know, he doesn't really listen to me. But, but it's fear based, you know. It's, it's fear-based. And then, and then this is what you know. If you have a pet, you know this. Uh, the the love-based obedience is the one that I think probably goes, goes beyond the moment or the set of circumstances. It's not based on an outcome or, or whether or not he feels like he's going to get punished. It's based on love and loyalty. Now, he's a lab, so as a furry family member, you know, loyalty goes a long way with him, you know? I mean, you love him a little bit. Sometimes I have to withdraw when I pet him because if I pet him too much, he just will just absolutely haunt me. You know, he's like, everywhere I go, he won't let me take a step. So I'm like, I'm gonna have to withhold some of my love from you, you know? But often in the church, we don't talk a lot about spiritual obedience because it feels like we're treating our spirituality like we would a pet. And so at best, we're afraid that it sounds like work-based faith, but God wants to, to challenge our thinking in this, and he does this in Scripture. People come to Jesus with different circumstances and different life experiences, and maybe you chose to follow Jesus because you wanted to experience heaven one day. Maybe the outcome seemed to be in your favor. Someone preached about heaven, and you're like, man, I, I don't want to miss out. Maybe you came to Jesus because you didn't want to experience hell. Maybe it was the fear uh, or, 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 or this idea that, that hell and the wrath of God that drove you to being obedient to his word. It doesn't invalidate your, your need for Jesus. Your need is nonetheless just as significant. But if we're, we're going to have skin in the game, we have to move beyond outcome-based or fear-based obedience in our spiritual lives and in maturity have to begin to understand what this love-based obedience is. It's a gospel-centered, radical obedience rooted in love, a love that supersedes any outcome and it leaves you unafraid. So it's not outcome-based and it gives you this boldness. Listen to what Jesus says in John 14, verse 15. He says this, he says, "'If you love me, keep my commands.'" Now, that seems like a pretty straightforward verse. So obedience isn't this effort to, to earn your salvation. You can't earn your salvation. Scripture teaches us that salvation is this gift that we receive from the Father who loves us. Obedience, however, listen to me, this is, this is crucial to your spiritual growth. If you're gonna grow spiritually, obedience is crucial. That At least eight times in the New Testament, we are told to make every effort in our growth to become like Jesus. So think of your spiritual uh, life like wings of an airplane. One wing of the plane is trust and the other wing would be obey, right? There are two wings that, that will keep your plane in the air spiritually, trusting God and obeying God. And if you remove one, your spiritual life will crash and burn. You will tank. Trusting God is connected to belief and obeying God is connected to following him, this practice that, that we call Christianity. And if you trust 
and you don't obey, you will claim to believe in a God that you don't follow. Likewise, if you obey and you don't trust, you will be following a God you don't believe in. So it plays out like this. Trusting without obedience equals hypocrisy. And obedience without trusting is legalism. And maybe you've experienced one of the two of those in a religious setting or a faith setting, a church setting. And part of our challenge is that obedience doesn't always look that spectacular. But we've not, we've not done ourselves a lot of good in church settings. We've often painted it in, in a worse light. They don't give too many awards out for being obedient. <laughs> in fact, most of us would see obedience as, as stifling. If you're a rule breaker in the room, the word obedience makes you feel a little claustrophobic, you know? I, I, I'd say this to, to my wife all the time. You know, she's like, hey, honey, you're going a little fast. And I'm like, eh. Right, am I? I don't know, you know. And then I, and then you know, if 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 you are somebody who doesn't obey speed limits, I'm working on it. If if you're somebody who doesn't do that, uh, like myself, then um, I I find myself going, I'm not going to slow down. I'm not going to slow down, mainly because you pointed out that I was going 10 miles over the speed limit, so I'm going to go 11 miles over the speed limit. You know, I, I'm telling you, like some of you, some of you know what I'm talking about. Like when you think of obedience, you're like, man, that just feels stifling. But to follow Christ. We have to, you have to embrace obeying Christ. And here's what I want you to know about this. When it comes to obedience, the, the way scripture lays out obedience in your spiritual life is that it's actually this life-giving freedom. And, and I'm not just trying to sell you obedience. I wanna get into the word on this. Here's where obedience actually gets exciting. While obedience doesn't always take on this spectacular form, it's where life is found. In fact, obedience is what gives us access to the kingdom of God. It's what gives you access to heaven. So when we look at the life of Christ, we look at Jesus and we're like, why is it that he was so adamant? And I, that Jesus was sinless and we understand this, but he was constantly listening to the Father in obedience following what Christ called, or what, what the Father called Christ to do. And Matthew 7, 21 says it like this. And not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not, not everybody's gonna enter the kingdom of heaven. In, ca in case you thought that's just where you go when you die. It's real clear. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who's in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. Jesus says it's not even about the appearance of obedience because some of us, we've actually been around church long enough where we can kind of look churchy. You can fake it. But it's about truly desiring the things of God in your life. Listen, listen to me, church. We can become so enamored by the spectacular over the spiritual. One author said it this way. Since miracles are relatively easy to manipulate or fake, they are a poor test of God's approval. Some miracle mongers are simply charlatans. Others are self-deluded individuals who replaced obedience to God with wooing and wowing the crowds. God's priorities are less fantastic than ours. They're more inward than outward. The kingdom of God is not about a big splash and bright lights. It's about a broken spirit bent on following God's ways. I love that. And whether we like it or not, our obedience to Christ is a direct reflection of our love for him. I wanna repeat that because some of us there's a disconnect in our love for Christ and our obedience for Christ, but our obedience to Christ is a direct reflection of our love for him. I'm gonna repeat this this morning over and over because listen to me, some of us are still determining whether or not we love Jesus and our obedience to Christ is a direct reflection of our love for him. The first time I heard these words, I got really upset. I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I thought... I thought, no, I love Christ. I'm just having a hard time breaking some old habits, right? Uh, no, I, I love Christ. I just need some time to live out some of my own aspirations. Just, I just need a little bit more time. I've got some things I wanna do. I, I love Christ. I'm just not strong enough to follow him like I want to. But the longer I argued, the more futile it got. Why? Because John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. There's not a lot to mistranslate in that. If you love me, keep my commandments. But Jesus, I can't do that. Is it that I can't do it or that I just don't wanna give up my old life? I mean, that's the wrestling. You see, church, most of us think God's just trying to whip us into shape. But the words that follow his call to obedience shows, up what he, shows us what he's up to. 
He wants to give you and me access to the things of heaven and to keep you from death and destruction. Don't miss this. Disobedience is causing death in us. Okay, the enemy, you have an enemy, if you didn't know this, the enemy, Satan, is a deceiver. And he wants you to be destroyed. He wants to destroy you. And so disobedience does just that. It destroys us. Now, he'll spin it in a lot of different ways. But Ephesians chapter 2, 1 says this, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are what? Disobedient. You were dead when you were following Satan, the enemy of of Christ, you were dead because disobedience had enveloped your life. It's a spirit that says, I will distance myself from God on this issue because I'm more interested in my way than his. All the while, our disobedience ends up destroying us. This is why obedience is such a, a key thing for Jesus and why he's teaching this to the disciples is because what he wants for them is for them to have freedom in life. Eskimos have used this very intriguing way of killing the wolves that they would regularly have to fight in the cold lands. They would put a, a knife in ice. It, it, maybe you've heard this. Um, this. This is such a fascinating illustration. They would put this knife uh, blade up in a block of ice, and then they would cover the ice in rabbit blood. And what would happen is these wolves would come in, and they would smell that blood. They would come in, and they would begin to lick the ice. And as they licked it, sure enough, the ice would melt away, and their tongue would begin to lick the, the blade of the knife. In fact, to the point where they were so hungry for blood that they would be then tasting their own blood. And what would happen is the next day, the wolf would be dead. Unknowingly, he was licking the blade of a knife, and it had eaten its own blood because it just couldn't get enough. And Ephesians tells us that there's a spirit at work in, the, in those who are disobedient, and the spirit leads us to death. It's enticing us in a way that's destroying us. And here's where the power of obedience comes in. Check this out. Obedience unleashes the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and in mine. If you're like, man, I, I, I'm, I'm finding, and, and some of you who have been walking with Jesus, you've experienced this. Man, I'm finding that my, my, my spiritual life has just kind of gone stale or I've plateaued or I don't have any, I don't, I don't feel like I have the power that I once had in my life. And, and it could very well be that there's some disobedient behavior in your life that has created for you this hindrance for the Spirit to do His work. In fact, the best prayer that you could pray today is this. God, would you reveal anything in me that is, is against what you want because I want your Spirit working in me. John 14, 15 says this. If you love me, keep my commands. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. If you love me, keep my commands. And what will happen is there will be this advocate which Scripture describes as the Spirit of God that will be with you, it will help you. You come into alignment and you begin to obey my word and the way I've called you to live and all of a sudden the spirit of God just infuses your life. Now, when you come to Christ, you have full access to the spirit of God. When you receive salvation, you have full access to the spirit of God. But many of us are living with limited access because of a disobedient way in which we're living. So we have access to the kingdom of God but we're not tapping into that access because we have an obedience, disobedience issue that we're wrestling out. John 14, 21 says it like this. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. I mean, it's all, we're gonna keep reading these. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love them and show myself to them. Just before this in chapter 13, Jesus says, if you do what I've called you to do, you will experience blessings in your life. You will, he will be able to pour out his blessing in your life. Now, listen, we know the opposite, don't we? If, if we want what our neighbor has, we call that discontentment. If we don't honor the unity of marriage, we find ourselves with brokenness. If we act upon our lust, we end up with shame. If we look to the world for comfort, it ends often in addiction. We try to attain this status and importance, and all of a sudden our hearts become full with pride. We act as though we are good enough, and then hypocrisy sinks in. We cover up our mistakes instead of dealing with them, and then we begin to live in lies. We choose pleasure over discipline, and it ends up in laziness. Yet God says, obedience to me will produce in you fruit, and that fruit will be the product of the Holy Spirit's work in your life. 
Now, if you're gonna walk in known disobedience, listen to me, this is so important for us. If you're gonna walk in known disobedience and try to resist the devil, you are wasting your energy. You are wasting your energy. You say, Cody, I'm, I'm planning on obeying God. I just have a few things I have to take care of first. There are a few things I'm planning to do, a few things on my agenda. Uh, so some pleasure I'm gonna indulge in and then I'll obey God. Make no mistake, listen to me. <laughs> Thomas Akempis said this best, delayed obedience is disobedience. Delayed, so see, it, it's, it, God doesn't work on that. Well, one day, God, when I get around to his schedule, because that doesn't work in the rest of your relationships, does it? For those of you who are, are married, does that work in your marriage? If you're like, well, I mean, yeah, when I get around to it. Does that work with your roommate? Does that work with your parents? or your, I mean, it, 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 it communicates a lack of love. Uh, this is why, man, one of the greatest words Rachel and I received when we were first parenting as as newly parents is somebody looked at us and they said, hey, whatever you do, now we, we've been parents for a while now, so this, this, this may, I don't even know if this is a parenting thing or not anymore, it probably is, and anytime I talk about parenting, I'm probably gonna tick somebody off, so just show me some grace. I'm gonna tell you this anyway, because I think it's really important. It was the best advice we ever received. We, I, we had some, some parents, some godly parents tell us, they said, whatever you do, when, when, you, when you raise your kids, don't do the whole counting thing. Don't do it. Don't do the like, hey, I told you, I told you to go to your room. One, two, two and three quarters, you know, like you get to, like some of you are like, yeah, I did that. Listen, I'm not judging you, okay? I'm like, I'm glad, glad we got some advice on this. But, but do you know the reason they told us not to do that? Because delayed obedience is disobedience. Like, like, it begins this habit. If you don't respond the first time, you create a system in your life in which you understand that I can delay obedience. And it wasn't until I began to understand the principle of obedience in my spiritual life that I understood this to an even greater degree. You see, often in our spiritual lives, we read and hear about God's love for us, but how do we show Jesus? How do we show the Father how much we love him? How do we show Jesus our loyalty, our devotion to him? Scripture tells us that God's love language is obedience. That's his, a chapter later in the book of John, Jesus explains even further how we show him we love him. Listen to what it says in John chapter 15. If you're there, turn over to John chapter 15, verse nine. It says this, as the father has loved me, this is Jesus speaking, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my father's commands and remain in his love. What's Jesus teaching us? He's told his disciples that his desire for obedience was because it was his avenue to experience the father's love. It was his avenue in, 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 in Jesus' humanity to experience the love of the father. And he goes on in verse 11, he says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Now listen, this is, this is, this is a basic spiritual, scriptural, biblical principle. Don't miss it. Some of us aren't gonna believe it, but it's right here. There is joy in obedience. There is joy in obedience. He says, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. I've told you this. I'm sharing this with you, Jesus says, because I want you to experience joy in your life. Why would Jesus say that? Because he is teaching us that disobedience leads to destruction. Verse 12, my command is this. Love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command. Jesus says, when you do what I've called you to do, the relationship you have with God moves from mere acquaintance to confidant. That relationship changes. See, some of us, we have had to take a step back spiritually and in our relationship with the Lord because of disobedience. And it feels a lot more like he's an acquaintance in our life than a friend and a confidant. Verse 15, 
Jesus says, I no longer call you servants because a servant doesn't know his master's business. Instead, I've called you friends for everything I learned from my father I've made known to you. Jesus flat out says it, that the secret to knowing God is this. When you walk in obedience to what he's called you to do, he begins to reveal himself to you in ways that you can't even imagine. This is why it's radical obedience, church. It's why we don't necessarily need to know the outcome because we have a confidence in walking and abiding with the Father and the creator of the universe who knows us inside. We have this confidence now that we don't have when we're walking in disobedience. When you're, when you're walking in disobedience, there's an insecurity and there's a, a, a lack of confidence, a lack of a, a solid foundation. And so you function from a place of Unhealth, verse 16 says this, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, this isn't temporary, and so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Jesus finishes by reminding us that it's not by our merit that we're able to do this, but it's because he chose us. If you're like, well, I can't do this. He's like, good news, I chose you. I chose you. Yeah, you, know, you didn't know, Jesus, when you chose me, how screwed up I was. And he's like, no, I did. I went to the cross for you, Cody, when you were at your worst. I chose you. And if you're here this morning and you think there's no way God would choose me, listen to me, you have to read scripture. Because God chose prostitutes, he chose murderers, he chose bookies, he chose folks who were shy, he chose the rich and the poor, men and women, he chose servants and officials, and he looks at you and me and he says this, you, you can do this not because you're strong enough, but because the Father in heaven is gonna give you everything you need. And he finishes in verse 17, he says this, this is my command, love each other. Love each other. He's speaking to the disciples and he wants them to understand that you can't do it alone, you need each other. It's why we gather every week. We need each other. Obeying Christ in a contradicting world is only possible if we're journeying together. Do you, ever, do you ever find yourself maybe going home at the end of the day and you're like, man, is it just me or is the world going crazy, you know? If you've been living in disobedience to the one who created you, listen, don't miss out on the reality that we are all in the same boat. If you're here and you're like, man, Cody, you don't know. Like, I have really messed some things up. I just, I just want you to hear this today. And, and, and if you're here for the first time or you've heard this, because we say this all the time, if you're here for the first time or, or you've been around here and maybe this has just become just words to you, I just want you to hear it afresh. We're all in the same boat. And we have all screwed this thing up. We have all had moments of disobedience. We've all lived in seasons of disobedience. And so many of us think, Man, this disobedience thing sounds like it might cost me a lot. And I don't want you to miss this. The cost, the cost of obedience is nothing compared to the cost of disobedience. An old American Indian tale recounts the story of a chief who is telling a gathering of young braves about the struggle within and and he said, it's like two dogs fighting inside us. Maybe you've felt this before. So it's like two dogs fighting inside us, the chief told him. There's one dog and he's good and he, and he wants to do the right thing. And the other dog always wants to do the wrong thing. And sometimes the good dog seems stronger and is winning the fight, but, but sometimes the bad dog is stronger and is winning the fight. And, and one of the young braves asks him, he says, who's gonna win in the end? And the chief answers with this simple phrase, he says, the one who wins is the one you feed. And each of us have a choice as to whether we will feed the disobedience in our lives or whether we will choose today to trust and obey. And if you feed radical obedience in your life, you will experience his spirit and his goodness in ways that you could never imagine. You could never imagine. Heaven itself will transform your life and the way you live in the here and now will be forever changed. And my prayer this morning is this. May we step into this life of radical obedience today and experience God's goodness. And he wants to desperately, desperately bless his children today. And so well, we're gonna enter, we do this each week, we're gonna enter into a time of prayer. And last week we preached on prayer and man, God just moved in this space. And, and I, I'm gonna ask uh, those who... Uh, our, our volunteers in, in our prayer area. If you're new with us, we have a couple doors over here to, to, to my left, to your right, that 
that is a, just a whole space that we've dedicated to prayer. And if, if you want prayer this morning, if you want somebody to pray, we, we have prayer warriors that are ready to meet you right where you're at and pray and intercede with you and on your behalf. And as we spend some time in prayer, communion is gonna be passed. And if you're a Christ follower, you've gone all in, you've decided to follow Jesus with your life, you can take that communion that represents the sacrifice that Jesus made for you and me on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven and we could walk in freedom. And, and if you're here and you're like, I don't know what it looks like to walk with Jesus, or maybe, maybe you feel so far from Christ because of some disobedience that you don't even know where to start. Man, don't leave today without receiving prayer. And so as we spend this next time in, in prayer and communion's past, uh, this room will be open and we're gonna worship one, one last song before our time's up. And, and during worship, that room's gonna be open. And after we're done here today, that room's gonna be open. We're gonna be here, but we want to come before the Father and today just ask, God, would you just deal with the disobedience in my life so that your spirit could just be poor? Do, do you know the greatest revivals we've experienced in this world have come through repentance. They come through repentance. It comes through this humility of coming to the Lord and saying, God, here I am. Would you, would you do in me what I haven't been able to do on my own? Father, I have not been faithful, but you are. So in your faithfulness, would you forgive me? Would you just find me as your child, someone that you chose? Would you find me in a place where I'm seeking you and asking and, and you know what? You're like, yeah, but what happens tomorrow when, when, or this afternoon when I found myself struggling with disobedience again? You, know, you come back to him again and you come back to him again and you come back to him again and you say, here I am. I need you, Father. I want, I want to embrace obedience because I want your spirit and the kingdom of heaven to be unleashed in my life. All right, let me pray right now. Father, you are good. And we just come before you and we just admit Lord, that we have often seen obedience as not this thing that is freeing and life-giving, but kind of this cumbersome um, yoke, <laughs> kind of this burden. And, and it was never meant to be that. Jesus, you meant for obedience in our lives to be what brings us closer to you. You, you designed forgiveness and repentance so that we could walk in obedience today, right now in this moment, and, and fully experience the Spirit of God poured out in our lives. So Father, we just pray for that. We pray for forgiveness and we pray for repentance. And I pray for those this morning who are wrestling with whether or not to place their faith and their trust in you. Jesus, may they not leave this place without finding the hope that only you bring. We love you. And it's in your name we pray.